Okay, so hello everybody and uh, welcome to the presentation of uh, Virt Electronic and Conrad uh, for Invisible Light, the world of infrared and ultraviolet LEDs. Uh, my name is Jelo Andreev. I'm a product manager by Virt Electronic since two years, responsible for the optoelectronics and uh, specifically infrared uh, uh, department. First of all, I would like to thank Conrad uh, for the opportunity to give this talk and present you the fascinating world of infrared and UV LEDs. And uh, to start, I would like to show you what we are going to talk about. In the beginning, we start with a short introduction and overview of what is a visible and non-visible uh, light and electromagnetic uh, radiation, to be more specific. After that, uh, I will show you some of the basic characteristics and applications and uh, specific know-how for infrared and ultraviolet technologies and sum up the presentation with the new product that will soon be available for you at the Conrad in the Conrad portfolio. Before I start with the presentation, I would like to tell a few words about my company, the Vjord Electronic ISUS is part of the Vjord Electronic Group. Uh, the company itself uh, has uh, sales of over 500 million of euro and over 6,000 uh, employees worldwide. We are present in more than 50 countries and production sites all over across the world in Europe, Asia and the US. We are one of the biggest European manufacturers of EMV components uh, and LEDs and power electronics. So now let's start with the real topic. And first, let's introduce you what is wavelength and what is visible wavelength. Visible wavelength is basically the visible light, uh, the light that we see in our everyday life. The visible wavelength, the visible light spans into a very small wavelength in the range between 400 and 780 nanometers. 400 is for the uh, blue region, purple, blue, and then 780s, red, deep red. But then to be more specific and to show you what exactly is this wavelength, first I should uh, show you this small graph where we see the different semiconductor materials and their energy band gap. And then uh, see the link between this energy band gap and the wavelength. Basically, the wavelength is defined by the photons, which are the uh, elementary carriers of light. And all of them, they have a specific energy. And this energy is basically uh, in the semiconductor material, the band gap energy or the energy at which carriers recombine. And to be more specific, I will show you here the aluminum gallium indium nitrate group, where you can see with these three mat uh, binary materials, we can make different alloys with different band gaps that will emit different wavelength from ultraviolet or purple, blue, up to green LED, changing just the concentration of material inside the LED. 
So, going further, we can also produce the same light, and the same uh, uh, emission, but in a smaller wavelength, shorter wavelength. Shorter wavelength regions are the regions below 400 nanometers, starting first with the ultraviolet region, and then going down in wavelength, we reach the X-ray and gamma ray electromagnetic uh, radiation, gamma ray also known to you as uh, radiation. The specific in this uh, uh, electromagnetic radiation is that uh, the carriers, the single elementary carrier, the photons are very high energetic and carry a lot of energy within every single carrier. On the other side of the visible spectrum, we find the infrared or the long wavelength uh, region. This is above, above 780 nanometers. In this region, when we start after the infrared region, we have the microwaves and the radio waves that you already know when you sit inside your car and to start the radio, your radio uh, catches the radio waves emitted from an antenna. But to focus on the infrared region and to describe it a bit more, I have prepared for you a slightly different graphic showing the radiation of black bodies at different temperatures. And then, for example, in this graph here, you can see the spectral emission of a very warm day, shown here in red. This is the emission of a black body at 300 Kelvin, or 300 Kelvin is equal to almost 27 degrees Celsius. Another example here is the orange curve, which is around 500 Kelvin. And basically, this is the emission that you have from your uh, back oven when you turn it on for baking, which is around 227 degrees Celsius. As you see, these regions already lay, this emission is in the region of more than one micrometer, so this is not visible for the human eye. And in comparison, the blue region or everything under this blue curve is uh, basically the emission of a simple tungsten lamp, incandescent lamp, also known as incandescent lamp. And uh, basically this is the emission of a black body at 2700 grad Celsius. And this is basically what we used in the past for illuminating our houses. To go a bit more further, then I will just point out that underneath the dark purple curve here, you can see the emission of the sun directly at the sun. Uh, and this is uh, around 5,500 5, grad Celsius. And to make it even more clear, I would like to show you how the whole picture looks like. So we start with the frequency or wavelength, and then here is around 10 to the minus 6 uh, nanometer. Then going here, we have the X-ray. We have the optical region that is UV and uh, infrared. Then we have the microwaves and the radio waves spanning more than uh, 12 uh, magnitudes in the whole region, for the whole region. But then I would like just to focus now on the ultraviolet region. And ultraviolet region is the region between 
10 and 400 nanometer and in this region we can define a few different smaller regions they are defined recently by the ESO 21348 as UVA between 315 and 400 nanometer this is the long wavelength ultraviolet that is uh, absorbed deep into the skin it leads to uh, eye damages and uh, it makes your skin age fa faster and leads to wrinkles then the UVB region between 280 and 350 nanometer is absorbed from the your uh, first uh, skin or your uh, top side of the skin your epithel and this leads actually for to sunburn and skin cancer again also eye damages then UVC region between 100 and 280 nanometer is basically absorbed from the ozone layer in the atmosphere and it's deadly for the cells and microorganisms. It's absorbed on cell level and directly destroys uh, the construction or the RNA of your cells. So going further, I would like also to introduce you the infrared light. It has again the same, uh, sorry, it has again the same uh, distribution as the ultraviolet light defined by ISO 21348. In this region, you can see that ERA region is the low or short wavelength region between 760 and 1400 nanometer. Basically, in this region, the most sources are LEDs and some laser diodes. The other important for this region is that it's very well detectable by silicon detectors, so it's used a lot for detection of different signals. And uh, so that uh, information. Infrared B region between 1.4 and 3 micrometer where the main sources are laser diodes. Uh, it found that this light is very good, can, can transfer very well and very good into optical fibers and into different medias without a lot of losses. So basically this is uh, basically the region where a lot of uh, telecommunication uh, devices are working, optical fibers, and there are two main wavelengths for this region, the 1.33 and 1.5 micrometers. Then going further, the third region is the IRC region between 3 micrometers and 1 millimeter. This is the so-called thermal region and this describes the uh, thermal emission of different objects as I showed you in the earlier slide basically this is the spectrum of different black bodies. Once we know what are different regions for the wavelength I would like to go further and now describe a bit in details what is the difference between the visible and non-visible light, why we call it like this, and what are the different parameters that stay behind. To do this, I would like first to go back and show you some biology classes with the construction of the human eye. Basically, all the visible light information is based on the human eye perception and in the human eye we can find two different detectors the roads and the cones 
The rods are the ones that detect the intensity of the light. The cones are the parts of the eye that detect the different wavelengths. So basically they are responsible for the different colors, the different color vision and how man perceives colors. And as you can see on the graph on the bottom, there are three different types of cones and every type of cone is responsible for its uh, wavelength region, the blue, the green and the red cone. This is basically, basically also the three main colors in the colorimetry. Um, further information about this detection and how actually this was studied, you can find in the two documents cited here, the CIE1931 is the first document that uh, described how the human eye perceives the light, how is the intensity described, and then further the CIE 170 minus 1 from 2006 describe actually how different wavelengths are detected and what is the detection region of different cones. For now, I would just like to show you here the radiometric measurements or the intensity of light. And then in here we need to define two different uh, measurements. One is the radiometric measurement, which basically defines the physical energy of electromagnetic radiation. And the photometry that describes the brightness of light. There is a direct link between photometry and radiometry. And uh, it was basically described by this CIE document from 1931. Here I will just make a short introduction. And you can see in the sensitivity or the intensity graph here, the red curve represents the radiometric measurement or the energetic power, optical power of the of your source. And then the green curve, the V curve is basically the eye sensitivity curve uh, or the rod sensitivity. And through a direct conversion with this formulation, we can get the, directly the photometric value of our beam or the red curve, the red area under the black curve. But basically, what is the radiometric measurement? Radiometric measurement is basically the power of the LED, of our, of our source. There different radiometric measurements. First, this is the flux. This is the total emission of the source. Or as seen here in the picture, we measure the whole area or the whole emission all that comes out of our source or the sun. It's measured in watt and it's described as a standard measurement from the document CIE 127 minus 1. The second one is if we take only one single beam of our source that goes through a de definite area, and this is the intensity of our source. Intensity is described as emission per solid angle, or in uh, terms watt per steradian. Again, this can be this measurement can be standardized and the standard is given in the same document CIE 127. Then the third measurement is basically the 
irradiance. Irradiance is how much optical energy is falling is falling over one area or the radiant flux per unit area. This measurement doesn't have any standard setup or standard output as it depends a lot on the area or the distance between the emitter and the area and uh, etc. further mm, so unknown values. This value can only be given and is usually given as a standard how much it should be in a working area or in your house or in a warehouse. But this cannot be given for a source, it can be given only for an area. And now we talked a lot about energy but or the radioemetric energy, but what is actually the radioemetric energy? The energy, this is the integral under the spectrum of the detected light. The integral under the spectrum, as you can see here, is the area under a spectrum. In this case, you see a spectrum, uh, the spectrum of one infrared LED with peak emission of 945 nanometer and the spectrum spans between 800 and 1050 nanometer. Now, the peak wavelength is the wavelength with the maximum power emission, as you can see here on the graph. Going further, describing the spectrum, we have uh, a few more parameters that can describe this. One of them, this is the dominant wavelength that you know from visible light. And the dominant wavelength is basically what your eye will perceive as a single wavelength from your emitted spectrum. The whole computation is rather complex and again given in CIE 1931. Here I would just surely refer to the chromaticity diagram area, which is the area inside this curve showing all the different colors. And then refer to the three points here. The first point here is relative to the spectrum. Each spectrum can be converted to, to X and Y coordinates and give a point inside the chromaticity diagram. The black point is the white point with coordinates one third, one third. When those two points are connected, they cross the boundary of the chromaticity diagram at a certain point, which is called the dominant wavelength. An emitter with XY coordinates at this point and will emit, uh, will be perceived in the eye as a single source with a single wavelength given as the dominant wavelength. And as I said, this is only uh, measurable for visible light from 380 up to 700 nanometer. Everything outside this region cannot be measured as dominant wavelength. Then for infrared and ultra for infrared regions we have furthermore the centroid wavelength. The centroid wavelength is basically the center of the mass of our spectrum or the wavelength that splits our spectrum into different parts with equal energy, which means that the area underneath the spectrum on the left side of the green curve is equal to the area on the right side. And this is basically important to know where is our center of the mass. 
So now, after we know a bit more, after we learned about the parameters of the LED and what is the of our sources and what's the difference between infrared and ultraviolet light, I would like now to go a bit deeper into the ultraviolet LEDs and uh, infrared application and properties. So first, again, to go back at the different regions. For UV LEDs, we can still uh, separate the different UVs, UV LEDs as UVA, UVB, and UVC LEDs, depending on which region their emission is. In the LEDs in the UVA regions are the most well known around. They classify with a lot higher efficiency and a lot longer lifetime compared to UVB and UVC LEDs. And there is abundance of applications, for example, like curing, printing, security forensic, counterfeit detection. Uh, maybe you all know when you have been to the dentist that currently they use a lot of different UV light for fast uh, drying of uh, the filling in the teeth or some of you may know when they go to the disco this uh, interesting light that uh, makes everything shine this is all due to the uv light uva light then uvb region is the very small region between 280 and 315 nanometer has very specific usage uh, for example medical therapy analysis and medical analysis of different uh, biological samples. Also, in small part, it can be used for tanning, but again, this is the region where one should also be a bit careful as it's absorbed in the epithel of your skin. And then UVC region is rather interesting region there is a lot of development running in the moment but LEDs in this region are still has still has very low efficacy and the 10 percent and very short left lifetime which makes them pricing competitive their, my, their main application is disinfection and sterilization as i said earlier they destroy microorganism, bacteria, viruses, everything on cell level. Then, just to go a bit further in the UV, UV uh, applications, I would like here to show you a bit more about the irradiance and dosage or this is basically very important for the UVC region where we have a lot of curing and drying of different materials and all this curing and drying of materials need some energy so the process would start here I just took the example of measuring a single LED and show you what basically you can see or what power is coming out of the LED. As I said, a single emitter or a single LED as a source with typical output power of 900 milliwatt at 500 milliampere, radiation angle of 130 degrees, and let's say distance between the LED and the sample is one centimeter. Then we can easily compute the irradiation area as a Lambertian source with radiation angle 130 degree. This is a circle with 
a radius equal to the cotangents of 25 degrees and then computing this as almost 12 centimeters square area. In fact, it's a little bit further, but we would like to keep it 12 for ease of computation. Then further, as Lambertian source, uh, the emission depending on the inclination from the 90 degrees of the axis, we can estimate that around 80% of the power of the LED is falling inside the irradiated area. Then we make a sum, uh, simple computation of the irradiance, first on the LED. This would be the radiant flux, uh, phi E, divided by the area of the LED. And this would be 0 0,9, 0 0.9 volt, watt divided by uh, 0.12 centimeter square, equaling 7.5 watt pro centimeter square irradiation. The same can be done for the work surface or the irradiation area, where we take the radiant flux again, multiplied by what percentage of the f power is uh, contained inside the area, and dividing again by the area. Th in this way, we compute 0 0.06 Watt per centimeter square. Okay, this is now a very big difference. But actually, where it, this difference comes from? Here, I would like just to show you the differences at one point we compute this exactly in front of the LED. We say that all the light coming from the LED is inside here. Going further, we increase the area and we keep the, LED, the area, the illumination area, but we keep the constant source. This decreases the irradiance. For example, here I showed also a few irradiances for simple LED would be 7.0 Watt per centimeter square and further if we make an array of LEDs and optics then at the output of the system we will have around 6 Watt per centimeter square and going further down at the typical working area from array of emitters we can have up to 4 Watt per centimeter square and this is typical values for LED lamps. In reality, our uh, material would have not would not be uh, measured through the irradiance, but we'll need some dosage or some energy to activate it. The dosage is equal by is equal the irradiance multiplied by the time, or what multiplied by seconds divided by centimeter square. And then here is the question, how we can increase this dosage? And the sample is simple. We illuminate the area for longer time, or we change the irradiance, or the distance between detector and working surface. Then going further to UV LEDs, uh, to infrared LEDs. Again, here uh, the difference between the regions can also be uh, directly connected to the difference of the ear emitters, A, B, and C emitters. As I said earlier, A emitters are LEDs and lasers with a lot of general application, machine vision, security systems, remote controlling, uh, different uh, measurements, biometric measurements, and so on. B region, where mostly laser diodes, diodes are the sources and no LEDs, is mainly for long distance and wireless communication. And then ERC, 
region is used mainly for detection of different uh, thermal emissions, specific application and basically used in military guidance and infrared spectroscopy. But coming back to the infrared A regions, I would like to show you the main application or what type of applications you can use inside your house. Just look around your house. Everybody has in his house a fire alarm or smoke detector based on infrared light or a motion detector that can sense if you're there or not and automatically turn on your light or turn on uh, your uh, air conditioner. For example, if you look directly at your sensor systems, authentication systems, uh, infrared LEDs are used for uh, recognition of your fingerprint or your eye. What else? Uh, we can say here, I think it's pretty self-explanatory, all remote controls that you use for your Wi-Fi or Hi-Fi stereo or your TV or your uh, garage door are based probably on infrared sensors. Then security and surveillance cameras, very good for night vision. Again, if you have a PlayStation at home, you know the new systems uh, they use also infrared systems to uh, know where you are and to know your movement. But I will just stop here and then just show you some of the uh, parameters of the infrared light. And here, the most interesting one, this is basically the viewing angle. and what actually is the viewing angle? As you can see on the two graphs underneath, these are two, two LEDs with two viewing angles, one with brighter and one with uh, uh, very narrow viewing angle. In reality, viewing angle is described with the angle where 50% of the radiative intensity is. For example, here we have two curves. One is for an emitter with 350, uh, with 130 degrees viewing angle, the blue curve, and the other one is an emitter with 90 degrees viewing angle, the red curve. Basically, the viewing angle actually describes the illuminance or the irradiance of your LED, how far and what area it can irradiate. And here is also the question how to choose correctly your viewing angle. Basically, I hope that this small graph can choose, can, can help you a bit further. Here, again, I have plotted three different, uh, uh, three sources with three different viewing angles, 120, 90, and 60 degrees. All the three emitters are emitting over the same area A. The illuminance over the A area, or the irradiance, sorry, irradiance because this is radiometric, uh, is the same because the area is the same and the power that is coming out from the source is the same. The difference is then the first source with 120 degrees irradiates an area very close to it and has a very broad irradiance, while a source with, 90 deg with 60 degrees will uh, irradiate, have the same irradiance over the same area at a distance four times uh, longer, a meter with 120 degrees. Basically, this can decide if you want to use a narrow beam or a wide view. For example, wide view beams would be applicable for uh, illumination inside buildings or entrance area. 
where we need to have a wide view of what is happening around us. And the narrow beam is more important for covering uh, large areas like building facades or open areas outside or in the open. So after this, I would just like now to introduce you what to expect from Vert Electronic and Conrad in the future. And those are the new high power LEDs uh, with UV and ultraviolet in the UV and infrared region. Uh, UV wavelengths between 385 and 405 nanometer with radiant angle of 130 degrees and optical power between 700 and 1100 milliwatt and possible forward current up to 800 milliamps. For the infrared LEDs, they're available in the two mainstream wavelengths of 850 and 940 nanometer and choice of different radiant angles between 130 and 90 degrees. By them, we have an optical power between 500 and 700 milliwatt and typical optical intensity between 200 and 250 milliwatt pro steradian. With this, I would like to conclude uh, my talk and show you a small summary of what we learned up to now. In the beginning, we have seen what is a visible and non-visible light, which regions in the visible and non-visible light are there, what measurement values we have for both lights, and learned what is the difference between a radiometric and photometric measurement, and what different op other optical parameters we have for the electromagnetic radiation. Then, specifically from the UV light, those are high energy carriers, dangerous for living organisms, and many industrial and healthcare application. And infrared light, long wavelength emissions, invisible for the eye, also used in a lot of industrial and home application like security, machine vision, and so on. And those both will be soon available by Conrad, supplied from Vert Electronic. With this, I would like to thank you for your attention.